My name's Louise Merritt. I'm one of the law fellows at Trinity College. I'm also a reader in international commercial law in the law faculty at Cambridge. And my name's Ben Spinola. I'm also a law fellow here at Trinity and I work mostly in public law and Roman law. This video is intended to demystify an understandably stressful and we think often misunderstood part of the admissions process by showing an example of a typical law interview. We've also included some reflections from some of our current students about their experiences at interview, including a student who was interviewed overseas. Although this video focuses on the interview, it's important to remember that the interview is just one part of our admissions process. It helps us to understand your interest in law and explore some of your ideas, but it's only one element of the process and evaluation. We also, of course, will have your school results and your predictions, your references, your personal statement, and your Cambridge Law Test. The Cambridge Law Test is a one-hour written paper that you'll be asked to take when you come for interview. You don't have to register or sign up for the test. Your college or the overseas panel that's arranging your interview will make all of the necessary arrangements. The Cambridge Law Test is a common paper across the Cambridge Colleges. It offers you an opportunity to show some of the skills and abilities that we have found good lawyers and good law students possess. It's a test about reasoning, it's a test about argumentation. You can see some sample Cambridge Law Test papers on our website, so you can get a, a feel for what might be involved. But it's important to stress that it's not a test where we expect any prior legal knowledge or prior legal training. We're focusing on those skills of reason and argumentation. It's not about legal knowledge per se. And that last point that Ben made about the Cambridge Law Test is also true of the interview. We don't expect any prior legal knowledge when you come to an interview in Cambridge. Of course, some of you may have studied some law. Um, you might be studying A-level law, for example, and you may want to talk about that and bring that into your interview, but that's not something we expect. We don't expect any legal knowledge um, when you come for your interview. We think that one, one of the best ways of preparing for a law interview is to think about the world around you and your own lives and see if you can think about some of the legal aspects there may be and the legal dimensions of what's going on in the world. You can feed that knowledge and interest by reading the newspaper, watching the news, reading uh, quality magazines and books and just really focusing on what legal dimensions there are and what interests you in the news and the world around you. There are no tricks or secrets to the interviews in Cambridge. We just want to see how you argue, what you think, and really just see whether you'd enjoy the Cambridge supervision process and enjoy learning and talking about law. Exactly what a Cambridge Law Admissions interview looks like varies considerably from college to college and from interviewer to interviewer. Most interviews, though, will involve some kind of exercise. It could be an exercise with a legal flavour, or it could be an exercise that involves moral or practical reasoning a bit more generally. You might, for example, be asked to read and think about an extract from a case, or to work through a particular factual scenario, or perhaps to try and explain how a statutory provision would operate in practice. Once again, though, we are not looking for any pre-existing knowledge of the law. If we want you to know some law for the purposes of the exercise, we'll give it to you. We'll give it to you in the interview or perhaps a short time beforehand. The exercise that you're going to see in this um, video is a typical mock uh, law interview. In our example, the candidate was given a page half an hour before the interview, which contains some facts and some legal information and some relevant law. You can find a copy of that page on the website. So in our example, the candidate had half an hour before the interview to prepare and to take some notes and just think through their ideas. In some interviews, you may be given a similar exercise, but during the interview itself. The exact way in which it's done doesn't matter. It's just a different way of doing a very similar thing. Our interview with Rihanna was not rehearsed. It's not scripted. And we didn't tell Rihanna in advance anything that the Cambridge Law Faculty and the Cambridge Colleges haven't already told you at an open day or via our website or our prospectus. 
please don't think of this as a model, ideal or perfect interview. It is just a typical example. We hope that by offering you an example interview, we can make the process a little bit more familiar and a little bit less intimidating. Please be reassured that if you are invited to interview, your interviewers will quite genuinely be excited to meet you. They want you to be as relaxed as possible and they want you to do well in the interview. We hope this video helps. Hi, Hi. you must be Rihanna. Yes. I'm Ben. Come on in and grab a seat. Do sit down and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Rihanna, my name's Ben. It's very good to meet you. I'm one of the Law Fellows here in college and with me is... Louise Merritt. Hello, I'm another one of the Law Fellows. And we're very excited that you've come for interview today. We have about 20 to 25 minutes together and we want to spend much of that time doing a legal exercise which I gather you've had yes. uh, for yeah. half an hour in advance. Uh, we will also make sure we leave some time at the end in case you have any questions for us. But perhaps before we get to the exercise we can start with the, the obvious question. Why are you interested in studying law? I think on my work experience I've kind of got a real understanding of the impact which the law can have on ordinary people. And I'd like to do something even after I leave university which does have an impact on people. I want to improve people's lives and I think that law is a very good way to do that. Um, I also don't kind of shy away from hard work and I think that I know I know that law is hard work but also I think that the subjects that I've chosen at A level mean that I have got used to writing essays, I've got used to doing research and I think that it's a natural progression for me onto law. Um, but also I think that kind of thinking about the skills that I have myself, I think that that kind of ability to scrutinise information and the ability to persuasively argue for what I think is right is something that I've been trying to develop, especially through kind of extracurricular things like debating and public speaking and those sorts of things. So yeah, I think I think it's just the right subject for me and I hope you'll agree. <laughs> You mentioned there uh, some legal work experience. I see in your personal statement you've been to a solicitor's firm and mm. you did some time in, in, in a major firm in London. Can you tell us what you saw in there? Probably a lot of hard work. but Yes, a lot of hard work actually. Um, I was quite young when I did the work experience, so it was all very fresh um, and I didn't know any law, so it was kind of a uh, it was a real insight into what it actually meant to be a lawyer. Um, I think that the thing that my work experience has kind of shown me most of all is that kind of even the unpredictable nature of law and that I thought I was, I thought that the office that I was in was focusing on kind of land law and those sorts of things but actually we were looking at a ramp for a shop um, and how that was going to work out, where the problems were with sort of building this ramp for a shop um, and something that you would have thought was just a matter of kind of putting some concrete down actually has such huge wider impacts on people just generally like the public and on the shop itself and I think that that was kind of the thing that I learned most was actually that all of these different decisions even things which actually may not have seemed massively interesting to me at first have so many different implications that actually you know it's all very exciting is what I learned I think that it really kind of got me interested in law um, and I think that yeah I think that's what I got from it really it got me excited about it because I couldn't really learn a lot about particular cases and things because I don't have any any sure. proper background or any textbooks or anything but it was it was helpful in confirming that I was interested okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's clearly a, clearly a, a, an interest in yours not just in the subject matter but also in the skills because you've done a lot of debating and public speaking and those sorts of things at school as well. Yeah. What, what is it that you enjoy about debating and public speaking? I think that, well personally I really like to be able to put my thoughts across kind of out loud. I'd rather do that than um, kind of confuse people and, and, and have people in a sort of strange email chain and things like that. I like the ability to actually meet with people and to be able to discuss ideas and I think that's one of the things that I like so much about say debating is that I feel it's very productive um, and that's another thing that I saw in my work experience actually is that lawyers do seem to work really well in kind of a team and together um, which is exciting for me because I do really think that to kind of work very much independently and not to have any proper dialogue kind of limits you a little bit 
Um, but I think it is, I think it's the, the fact that I'm able to write what I believe about a thing and to be able to present that as persuasively as I can. But then also the fact that I'm then able to, to share that with other people and to, to gain more from it because actually everybody makes mistakes and you're not, people aren't very good at spotting their own mistakes. So actually it's a really productive forum and it's a good way of kind of training your brain to think about things from different directions because everybody has their own way of dealing with ideas and actually it's much more useful if other people are throwing ideas at you and you have to tackle those as well because it it kind of changes the dynamic of of the way that you work I think. Okay well should we engage in a dialogue about yes, some of your ideas? Some of ideas <laughs> shall we? Um, we hope you've had a chance to have a look at yes. this problem mm -hmm. um, obviously we don't expect you to know any law um, what we've asked you at the end whether you can think about uh, the arguments that are likely to be made by uh, both the prosecution and the defence. Yeah. So can you just maybe start just by running through what you think the main arguments will be in this case? Okay, so I think there are a number of arguments and some of them are quite complex really. So I think starting with the prosecution who want him to be convicted, who want the conviction to stand, um, I think that obviously the baby has died and during the pregnancy Tony caused his mother significant trauma um, and I think that when he's already been charged with intent to cause grievous bodily harm and the definition of murder which I have on the on the sheet is um, to call like an act which causes the death of a human being and the call and that they've done that with the intention of causing death or with the intention of causing grievous bodily harm well he's already been convicted of intent to cause grievous bodily harm and now the baby has died um, also, I think it's reasonable to suggest that grievous body harm on a, the, on a pregnant abdomen is going to have some impact on that baby. I'm not sure that anybody could deny that if you stab someone in the stomach and they are pregnant, that there would be some potential harm to that child. Um, also, I think the fact that there's only two weeks which pass between um, the incident and going into premature labour suggests that there is some sort of link between it because, I mean, people, and I'll come on to this in the defence, like people do have premature births, but it does, there does seem to be some kind of causation there, but that's, that's not as strong an argument, I wouldn't say. Um, there's also the fact that if it is that the attack had some part in causing this premature birth. It is the premature birth itself which has, has harmed, well not the birth itself, but the, the fact that the baby was born prematurely which has harmed it, um, or him. And the fact that he was born prematurely and then had the lung condition which is attributed to that means that it was the prematurity. And if we can attribute the prematurity to the fact that his mother was attacked, then I think it's quite a, a clear connection between Tony's behaviour and the death of the baby. But I think that's where the problem arises. So then going on to the defence who want to overturn the conviction, I think that the fact that Mary obviously went to a hospital cause, because she'd been stabbed three times and the doctors said that that hadn't harmed the baby um, means that the, it, they're going to struggle to to convince people that it was the attack which caused the prematurity because actually many babies are born prematurely it's not a completely rare thing and he i mean he's not phenomenally early there are babies who are born more early than that and don't have the lung condition so actually well one he could just have been born prematurely and he's a first baby i i, I assume from that i don't know that but if he is then there are lots of other problems which could be the cause of the prematurity and also lots of babies are born prematurely and survive and are very successful and don't have lung conditions so actually whether that's something that he's had any influence on is 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 hard to hard to figure out um also the fact that yeah so it is kind it kind of is it's just bad luck really that the baby had that condition that's a shame um, obviously, but whether it's Tony's fault, I don't know how we would know that, especially when the doctors said that it hadn't harmed the baby. Also, the fact that they decided to charge him initially with intent to cause grievous bodily harm, 
um, and wounding rather than, say, attempted murder, maybe suggests that they didn't think he was intending to kill anybody, which, I mean, obviously that's an argument which would need to be reconsidered in light of the new evidence, but it, it's possible to be able to say that actually he wasn't trying to kill anybody. Um, but obviously the definition of murder doesn't, it, you don't have to intend to cause death, you can just into, intend to cause grievous bodily harm, which, which they've said he did do. Um, also, the fact that he stabbed her three times but only once in the abdomen suggests that it wasn't the baby that he was trying to hurt or kill. I'm not sure the fact that there were two stabs elsewhere and one stab in the abdomen would suggest that that wasn't the main site of attack. So actually, that almost that's the anomalous stab is the one in the stomach and that could have been because because he was clumsy it doesn't necessarily mean that he was ever trying to actually hurt the baby but the fact that he did stab her in the abdomen obviously means that the baby had quite a high chance of being made poorly um so i think that kind of the arguments follow that for the prosecution the baby died he's already been charged with grievous bodily harm and that constitutes murder and I think that the thing that they need to convince the judge of is that it's reasonable that a stab in the abdomen during pregnancy could be such a significant like stressor or factor as to cause premature birth. Um, and then the argument for the defence is kind of that the baby died, but it wasn't anything. It wasn't because of what he did. It wasn't because of the act of, of wounding the mother. Um, the mother was told at first that he hadn't been harmed. And also prematurity is not that uncommon. And furthermore, like the, the illness that he then had owing to the prematurity is also even less common. Um, and lots of babies would have survived that. So the death can't be attributed to Tony. Okay, thank you very much. And we've got some, lots of very good arguments on both sides. Um, we want to just explore a couple of things, maybe with you in a bit more detail. Mm -hmm. And I'm so you referred to the definition of murder in, in yeah. paragraph six, which is good because it tells us what the definition is. Um, should we see if we can go through each of the elements, some of which you've talked about in a lot of detail, some not so much. So mm -hmm. we've talked about the defendant's got to perform an act. Yes. Well, which, and the act here was... Stabbing. Stabbing. Yeah. So that seems straightforward. Um, which causes death. And that, I think, is one element which you did explore in, in some yes. detail. And I think I agree with you. I think will definitely be one of the major issues. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you said, there's really two causal stages aren't there there's mm -hmm. the whether the stabbing caused the premature birth yes and then secondly whether the uh, death resulted from the premature birth mm -hmm. because of the lung condition yes. and and i think you've made some very good points about that and you'd have to prove both of them mm -hmm. um do you think there should be let's say that we can prove um that the stabbing did contribute to the baby yeah. being born early w would it matter whether the 50%, there was a 50% chance of the baby then dying of the lung condition, or even if it was only a 10% chance, would, would we not just say, well, um, but that is in fact what happened, so it's, we can say that that did cause the death. Other babies might have survived, but yeah. do you think that really matters? I think my personal opinion is that it um, shouldn't matter. I think that if, the, if we can attribute the stabbing as the, as the premature birth, then I don't think that the fact that the lung condition may or may not have happened and he may or may not have died, the fact that he did die, I think, is sufficient to charge him with murder. I think if we can attribute the stabbing to the premature birth, then because it's the prematurity itself that's the cause of the death, um, rather than, I mean, he wouldn't have had the lung condition if necessarily if he hadn't been born prematurely. So, yeah, I think, I think that it's fair enough to say that. But I also am conscious that... that I need to be able to distance myself from the problem because obviously, obviously, it's a it's a horrendous it's a horrendous act, and I I want to be fair to him, um, but I do I do still think even if I'm being as kind of distant as mm -hmm. possible that if he if he caused the premature birth and the baby died as a result of the premature birth then he caused its death. Yes, I mean one of the ways, of course, we distance ourselves is is sort of to be dispassionate by focusing on. The, the exact words of mm, the offence, which yes. is something you you did do early on. So so yes, going back to that. So I think we've explored causation in, in quite a lot of detail, but mm -hmm. there are other things, of course. So it's got to perform an act which causes the death, and it says of a human being. Yes. Yeah, and, I did think about that a little bit. Do you think there's an issue about is is a baby before it's born a human being, and and does that matter here? 
so this is something I've studied a little bit um, in, in my A-level in uh, philosophy and ethics. And I think that, well, the baby, when this happened, the baby was, I think, viable, which is kind of the, the stage at which the law starts to see, or at least in some instances starts to see the baby as as a being of its own. So it's when like abortion would become illegal if, if the baby was able to survive outside the womb on its own, which obviously this baby in particular isn't because he's also has additional problems, um, then we would be considering him as as his own entity. Um, but I also definitely see that as a problem. I think that the fact that he died when he'd been born means that he was a human being. Yes. So actually, in this case, yes. But I think had she miscarried, for example, then that would be a more a more challenging situation. But actually, considering that he was born and died, I I think that 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 yeah. means yeah. You make a very good point. So in other words, in this case, there was a human being. On yes. The view. Yeah. Do you think? I mean, it's interesting because you've talked about the ethical that you might have thought about the ethical issue and mm. of course there might be a rule about abortion yes of course for the criminal law and the purposes of this offense you, you might have a different definition yes yeah necessarily so here we're talking about according to the terms of this uh, provision here that you have to be a human being yes which might which might you might answer that in a different way mm -hmm. than you would in a different context yes so, okay. and, and i think you make a very good point that maybe it didn't matter on the facts here but yes what, what, any thoughts about whether you think a baby before it's born can be classified as a human being in in accordance with the terms of this provision um i think that i can see that the there's kind of a slight dilemma here in that it, it isn't simple because because actually it's it's not the same as if he'd killed Mary, if he'd killed the mother. That that it seems to be a different issue. But why do you say that would be a different issue? I suppose because because we do treat. I know that people have lots of different opinions about this, but the fact that we do treat people who are already who've already been born with a different kind of value to how we treat the unborn means that in this kind of a human being would be a more independent being which which means that kind of he, he couldn't be if he was if if the baby is still kind mm. of in utero he's not actually he's not actually yet a, a, a human being whose death can be caused i think like there might be a problem in having a death before a birth in in okay, this but you said earlier that of course the baby was born and yes. died after that. So there is a human being at that later point in time. Yes, yeah. And so Mary was a human being at what time? The baby was a human being at a different time. How, how does that fit into to the, the words of the provision here? You're drawing a distinction, I think, based on when something happened. Yeah, so the distinction is between it, the distinction I'm drawing is at the point of the baby's birth. So at that point, I'm I'm kind of treating them as two separate human beings, um, but before that, more as one. And the the thing with this case in particular is that we do eventually have two human beings, and we have two live human beings. So actually, what happened before his birth? I mean, nothing affected him before his birth. He was only affected, like, as he was born, um, which means that until then he's not really needing to be considered because actually it's Mary who was injured, and as long as he was, he was inside her, mm -hmm. we had no reason to suspect that he was injured. He was actually deemed to be okay by doctors, and it was only once he was born that the problems became apparent, and at that point. Once he was born, once he had left Mary, he was his own human being, I think, kind of quite definitely. I think the problem arises in the fact that when he was born, he wasn't attacked. He was attacked when he was inside her. Um, and so, so if he wasn't a human being then, then his death later on doesn't count.
because because actually that's not the same he's not the same being supposedly if if actually he wasn't a human being before i think that, that that's helpful because you've you've identified that there might have to be a human being at the time of the the act and that yes, first yeah, part of yeah. the provision is there anything else that might i don't know what the law is on this point it doesn't doesn't yeah. seriously matter is there anything else that that would fall into that same category something that might have to be true uh at that time do you think looking at the the provision that you've got um, just in the, do you mean just in the case of... So, so you were saying that there had to be a human being at the time of the stabbing? Yes. Is there anything else that turns on when there was a human being who, whose death was caused, do you think? Um, in particular, is there, another, is there something else we have to show which we haven't really talked about so much in paragraph six? Not sure. I'm not quite sure I understand where you're coming from. Okay, so, so you, you helpfully said <clears throat> it doesn't matter for the death mm -hmm. when the baby was born, because in this case the baby died after being born. Yes. And you said there might be a problem with whether the stabbing took place at a time when there was a human being, because the baby hadn't been born at the time of the stabbing. And just looking again at, at paragraph 6, um, is there anything else that might have to have been true for this conviction to work, that required there to be a human being at the time. So it wasn't a problem for the the death. No, but the fact that that he didn't he didn't wound that human being. If the human being, yes, yeah. Okay, so, so, the, so there if, might be that problem yeah. about who was wounded. Yes, yes, precisely. Yeah, and I think that's something I was trying to bring out with the fact that when I was talking about Mary. Um, kind of it was it wasn't the baby he was necessarily trying to to hurt so actually the baby's death even if like we can agree that the baby consequently died because of what he'd done to his mother it wasn't about what he'd done to him if you if you understand what i mean by yeah. that it wasn't actually and actually i think you've said two things that are quite helpful there rihanna you said that it wasn't um the, the stabbing perhaps to the baby, yes. which picked up on that earlier point you made yeah. about how many stabs there were. But you also said maybe it wasn't the baby he was trying to hurt. Does he yes. have to have been trying to hurt the baby, do you think? Well, um, I think, I think that actually, I was, when I was writing the notes about this, I was, I was thinking that it was a bit ambiguous because it says that it's done with the intention of causing death and the intention of causing grievous bodily harm but so that would kind of suggest that he was trying to do it if it's had if it has to be done with intent then he is he is trying to do it but also um i think there's kind of a problem in that when people talk about say manslaughter um as something that's slightly different to well obviously quite different to murder in that it's if say you so i read um in the news recently about the the elderly gentleman who had reversed into some ladies mm. in the car park and I think he was charged with manslaughter and, and the sentence isn't really relevant but the fact that that is manslaughter is because it was an act he wasn't trying to hurt anybody and actually <clears throat> he is trying to hurt someone he might not have been trying to to kill the baby or, or whatever but he was obviously there was no reason for him to be stabbing someone if he wasn't trying to hurt somebody there was no there was no kind of it wasn't like he turned around with a, a knife and accidentally. Sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think you said when your first run through, what, what do we know? We know that because what's he pleaded guilty to already? Yeah, he's already pleaded guilty to um, in like offensive wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. So we know that that is is kind of satisfied. But who was the intent towards in, in towards that? Mary? Right. So I yes. guess that's the question. Yeah, and that's the enough. that's the yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, it's distinguishing between the baby and between. But you yeah. also said earlier that, you know, if you do, you stab someone in the abdomen. Yes. And Mary was, what, about seven, six months, six, six or months, seven months pregnant yeah. at this point. So one can imagine that Tony, as the father, also knew that yes. she was six yeah. or seven months pregnant. Yeah, and I think it would be visible by then, as I, I would mm. find it very hard to... Sure. In, it has, in, <laughs> he didn't in, know. In the ordinary course. Yeah. Does that change what you're thinking about the trying to or the intention element here? The fact that he knew that she was pregnant, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that I think that um, it's entirely reasonable to expect a, a grown man to expect that if you wound Mary, if you wound someone, an expectant mother, 
that that would have some effect on debate. I think that is an an accepted level of awareness amongst mm-hmm. uh, amongst okay. all. So, so, so it sounds to me as though you're saying, well, he he must have known, or he could have known, or he was taking the risk that by stabbing Mary in the yeah. abdomen, is that the same as intending to cause grievous bodily harm or intending to kill the person who actually died? Do you think? I think that according to this definition, yes, because actually he was the very act of him wounding, as as has been dealt with in the previous conviction um we've accept we've accepted previously that Mm -hmm. he was trying he was intending to harm somebody someone and i I, obviously the the what we're coming to is the fact that the the crux of this is is what distinction we make between mary and her baby and her son um and i think that obviously it's caused the death of a human being well, the death of a human being has happened. Um, and we know that he was intending to harm at least the mother. Mm-hmm. And we accept that most people, I think all people with a, uh, with a sort of sufficient mental capacity, which obviously would be determined separately, if we accept that he has a, a kind of sufficient mental faculty to understand that if you harm a pregnant woman, that will possibly impact on okay but when when i wear my pair of shoes yeah right i i understand that in wearing my shoes i might scuff them or i might wear out the sole yeah do i intend to scuff them do i intend to wear out the sole when i know that that's a risk of wearing them no no you don't you're you're not setting out to to scuff the soles of your shoes you're setting out to wear the shoes to protect your feet and to be able to walk on different surfaces. but i think that here there is i think that you i think i at least am struggling to be able to make the distinction between obviously a stabbing which is the stabbings are not intended to do anything other than this kind of a stabbing is not intended to do anything other than harm there isn't any other this isn't a side effect of of don't know like I, there is nothing you could kind of think of which would be another outcome i mean obviously he might want to go to prison he might want something he might want something else he might be being paid to do it there are lots of other things that that could be a motivation sure. but actually that's all resultant through the wounding so i i i, I think I, I would struggle to be able to see it in the same light as the scuffing your shoes i think that okay. that it, yeah it's problematic mm. Okay, thank you very much um, mm-hmm. for that. Um, I'll just take those notes from yeah, you, finally, sure. just so um, you know where they are. Thank you. Do you want the problem back? Uh, yes, thank you. Now, <clears throat> we said we'd leave some time, Rihanna, in case you had any questions for us. There's absolutely no reason you should have a question. If you do, you're very welcome to ask it, but we don't expect you to have a question. I don't think I do have like a that. question, no. <laughs> okay, okay. thank you very much for coming. It's been thank lovely you. to meet you. Thank yes, you it's been lovely to meet you both as well. I've enjoyed that. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks.